Hello everybody, my name is Adam Pearl and I'm going to read some poetry for you as part of Poetry London's virtual reading series. Thank you to Poetry London for inviting me to read and thank, thank you, the audience members, for tuning in. Now, before I begin reading, I would like to encourage you all to please support the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it is going out and protesting, whether it is spreading the word on social media, whether it is donating money to black organizations, uh, whether it is uh, buying work, books by black writers and uh, works by black artists and uh, products from black businesses, please make sure that you do your part to support this movement, Black Lives Matter. Okay? Thank you. Now, <clears throat> for my reading, I'm going to read two pieces for you, and for my first, I decided to reach back into the past, all the way back to my first book. This is Beautiful Mutants. It was published in 2011 by Caitlin Press. And the piece that I'm going to read from Beautiful Mutants is called The Butterfly Room. <clears throat> Before she enters, Belinda remembers what her father told her when she was nine and first diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. Her elbows had been bent inwards and crossed over her chest as they are now. Her little brother, being little and possessed of the dark sense of humor that little boys have, told her she looked like a vampire sleeping in a coffin. Her father, an entomologist, wheeled her into the alcove, looking out on the family garden. Sharp greens, sugary pinks, and flashing yellows flared in the sun. Her father knelt beside her. He said, Belinda, you know what you look like? He leaned down and touched her shoulder. His dark eyes slipped over his glasses. Her lips pinched. You look like a butterfly in a cocoon, your limbs wrapped in silk, ready to spring out at any moment. She lingers at the door, reaches for the knob, misses. Her doctor's words from earlier in the day, misunderstood muscle. He had seemed pleased with his phrasing, leaning back with his file in front of him. She maneuvers her chair, taking her time aligning herself. She reaches and settles her hand on the knob, lets the metal's queerness radiate throughout her palm. On the door is a wooden slate, the room's titles burned into it in deep black block letters. You can almost hear, she can almost hear, the flutters. She twists the knob and pushes in the door, a screen of dark netting. The humid air of a greenhouse, a hint of the old concrete in the solidity of the ground. This used to be the garage. The smell of stale grass clippings and spilled oil has been replaced by the scent of minced black earth and green bloom. Her brother loves monsters. Just down the hall on his bedroom door is a portrait of Nosferatu, the bald vampire with his arms crossed over his chest, his eyes blazing. <clears throat> his nails, long and predatory, could claw through concrete. She asked him to take it down, but he persisted, as little boys do. Inside his room, from the brief glimpses he's allowed her, the walls are glossy with monsters, bent faces, speckled scales, speckles of blood flashing white in the sunlight drifting in from the blinds. He's at that age, her father said, where he is obsessed with strange things. He, her father, was working at his desk at the time, gripping a large beetle with the tweezers. I'm sure his fascination will dwindle off, he said. She shuts the door. A few of them wait for her, resting on the netting. With as much care as she can manage, she negotiates her way through the screen's opening, a long slit in the middle nudging forward the joystick on her chair. One of them, a leopard-spotted painted lady, 
steps off the netting and whisks on into the room. The others hold their ground, sinking into their six-legged stances. Sunlight floods the room. A Japanese maple rests in the middle, its branches spreading along the vaulted glass ceiling. She steals her chair down the earthen path and comes to rest underneath the tree. Shadows undulate on the ground. She glances up, sighs. True holes through the maple's leaves. Caterpillars, speckled and dark, park the leaves and the bark. Red and gray cocoons abound. The air is moist and valloping. She makes a noise, a car dressed loud enough to stir. She listens closely for the light whirr of wing beats, sees the frolicking ochre, the flapping purple, the whirling yellow, the purple shot, the black veined white, the Apollo, the monarch, the Mojave checker spot, the Danube clouded yellow. Her favorite is the purple edged, its wings billowing out like a cloak. She loves how some of them look exactly like their names, and how some of them look nothing like their names. In this room, she feels like Belinda. Her arms curled as if in metamorphic slumber, the tiny, fibrous legs of her peers stirring the lightest nerves of her skin. To her, the itch of transformation. Now this next poem is a little bit more recent, and it's called School for the Deaf. <clears throat> a. You gasp, awakened by a bucket of cold water, a gauzy autumn morning. A drained sunrise. You shiver, strain to see the house parents' fingers whipping and flicking in the fibrous gray light, wordless yet communicative fingers. You wipe your face with your sheet, bite back a sob. The teachers always tell you to use your voice even though you already have one. When you speak or try to speak, it's like laying an egg through your mouth like balancing a tire on your throat, like lifting a barbell with your tongue, hoping it doesn't cat tip or catch on a corner, you must hoist your voice. Right now you can't lift it. It's too heavy. From what you can see on the house parent's lips, you can't use your fingers. When another boy picked his nose, the principal tied his hands with rope. Could do the same for signing. You watch your dorm mates whose names you don't know, even though you've been here two weeks. In the cold dorm, you watch their mouths, hoping to find seething shapes, hoping their teeth will strain whatever vapor words are made of, hoping their tongues will lift and toss their words, hoping their words will clench before you. Their words slide like arrogant ghosts through the fibrous dormitory air. After class, you practice mouth movement before the mirror, trying to build your voice's muscle, pushing against the words as though they might bury you alive. You see the house parents' thick digits, knuckles furred like a tarantula's knees, the shrill drum light fattening the fat hairs, spidery hands seeking to measure, seize, grasp, coax, convince. The house parent, a dull husky man who laughs like a wolverine, toothy laughter carried by a thrusting jaw meant to wood you off. You can't believe that a real person's laughter can be so hostile. B. Speaking in class is chewing vegetables grown in a, in a cave. The words clack against your teeth. Filthy, fossilized turnips, canvas lettuce, concrete carrots leaving a flinty taste in your mouth. The teacher is a strict sonneteer, slaughtering his students' unwieldy syllables into place, giving them endramments, iambs, spondies. He shows you a poem, pointing to the last two lines. Though the morning was cold, Tom was happy and warm. 
So if all do their duty, they need not fear harm. The teacher's clean-shaven lips crisply emit the words. Go ahead. Through the morning, the teacher's hand traps the air. Though, though the morning, you make a fist and look at your classmates. Your hands are bound and gagged. Though, good. Though the morning, morning, more, morning. Morning, you're not saying the R sound. R, R, R. You smile at the teacher's teeth. Make the sign for funny. The teacher slaps your hand and you drop the poem. The teacher points and tells you to sit down. At night, in the dark, in the quiet, you fold down your sheet and sign to the ceiling. An invisible radius encircles your hands, stifling your movements. You sign in quick, tight motions. Whisper your signs. You look around the dorm, hoping to find someone to share your signs with. You fall asleep, dreading the bucket of cold water. As the weeks drain away, your signs become marginal, little finger flicks to fill the silent gaps. C. <clears throat> One night before bed, before the house parent arrives, you and your drum mates make hand shapes on the wall. The others make rabbits and geese, you make a gorilla, a reindeer, and with the help of a headless stuffed elephant, a lion, using the stuffing as a snarled mane, its grizzled snout nearly lifelike in shadow. You don't stop. You can't stop laughing. Your retracted laughter, your leashed laughter, has like a starved bat left dense in the walls of your mouth. D. The church is full of mottled light. You finger a trip in the pew. Watch the tall priest. Read his lips as best you can. Adjust your clunky hearing aid. It's like trying to trap echoes in a box. The priest waves his hands but doesn't sign. Thankfully, he has a mouth like a whale shark. St. Francis de Sales, the patron saint of the deaf, was born in 1567. One day, St. Francis' servant introduced him to a young deaf man named Martin. Back then, people thought the deaf were mentally ill, but St. Francis saw that Martin was quite intelligent, so he took it upon himself to educate him. The priest beams, but doesn't say how St. Francis educated the deaf man, leaving you to imagine ropes, cold water, raw red hands, speaking exercises that loosened Martin's teeth. You wonder... Why the patron saint of the deaf isn't deaf? Wonder if there are any deaf saints, if a deaf person can achieve sainthood, if a deaf person can properly receive the word of God. At night, you decide to become a saint. At night, beneath the sheets, within the ropes forming in your mind, you whisper, you pray, with your hands.
Thank you for joining me, everybody. Thank you again to Poetry London, and please take care and stay safe.